There we go. Good morning, Mr. Fisher. Um, well, welcome back. 2023. Hope everybody's off to a good start. Uh, it sounds like everybody's really busy and uh, shaking and moving and making it happen out there. And uh, once again, thank you. We've got, uh, I think, a good list uh, for safety topics uh, lined up for the year. Uh, we can share that again at the end of the meeting, but uh, uh, I'm eager and excited to get our group back going. So since our last meeting, I just wanted to reach out and open up a topic with the group to, to see what have you seen out there? How how are things been? What are some things that maybe you have noticed out there on the job site or within your, within your office that uh, maybe we can communicate to uh, ensure that, you know, these near misses get uh, addressed. So if there's anything you want to talk about when it comes to, uh, an, uh, you know, something being avoided, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You guys got anything, anything that we should uh, be aware of or you want to share? Starting out 23 quiet. I think so. So far. So far, right. I know that, man, it seems like it's a cold winter out there this year. You know, uh, a lot of times here in Colorado, right, it'll snow and the next day it'll be gone. But the snow seems to be sticking around this year. Um, so I know it's really cold out there. I know that taking care of uh, make, making sure you're packing in layers, right, but also making sure that your vehicles are in good repair. They're strapped down good. Lots of snowy days, right? So things like that, you know. Uh, one safety thing that I noticed, and this didn't, this happened actually in my neighborhood, is uh, that this couple, two houses down from me, has got a all steel roof, right? And it, because of how cold it's been, that snow stayed, right? Didn't melt, right? So it became real heavy and hard upon the roof because of, it was able to slide and it slid down and uh, hit the hit the old guy and and broke the windshield on his car. Uh, so little things like that, you know what I mean? We pay attention to it uh, at, at work a lot of times, but, you know, let's, let's, you got to pay attention to those things, you know, uh, uh, getting that ice and that snow knocked off like a steel roof, you know, that stuff comes down, it's not stopping. And so uh, just look out for that stuff. Uh, well, and there is difference in plowing between counties and even cities. And unfortunately, um, we did have a um, someone, it wasn't work related, but that was driving after hours and actually had a fatal accident. So oh, wow. um, we've just, um, in all of my new hire things that I've done and everything else, we've just really, really, really urged people like, just take your time, even after work, you know, that you're in a hurry to get home or when you're going out to new job sites, give yourself plenty of time because, um, yeah, it's it, it's so we've had a little bit of a rough start this year, but well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, but it's something definitely. I uh, mean, right? Because we're not proactive about it, we're going to be reactive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yeah, to with the communication, just slow it down a little bit, right? Uh, and you're right, the snow plowing. I live in a private community, and so my that they don't even hardly do mine and when they do it they put it in the middle so if yep. you're always driving on the side it's it's horrible right we did have a pretty good snowfall so yeah uh uh just be super aware right uh and, and take it slow right Make yeah sure well that windshield wiper cleaner mm -hmm. so well we it. told them guys especially when they're um you know we're, we've been very fortunate we have a, a pipeline of work to do that puts us out in new areas that they weren't in in December and now they were in into the first part of January and with that snow and um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a bad deal. So, yeah. And even if you don't, you know, I mean, yeah, it's horrible when you have a, a personal injury, but even damaging equipment, right. It, it's all about, right. Uh, uh, making sure you've got good ratings and, and you're being safe. So uh, multiple factors there when it comes to the weather, you know, uh, I believe you all do uh, JSAs, right, during winter conditions and things like that, right? Uh, job site safety analysis to say, hey, we it's forecasted to be freezing tomorrow, right? We've got a we've got a foot of snow out there. Uh, some of the things we got to be aware of, right? Those check boxes. 
Very cool. Anybody else uh, uh, have anything you wanted to point out to us or uh, make us aware of? Well, one thing that I've uh, we actually did was uh, when it was really cold that, that day that it was in the negatives and they were saying that you get frostbite really quick. Uh, we actually had the guys stay home that day because we realized like, we went through all the like the daily walk or routine to get into the job site. And we're like, by the time we get into the job site, if anybody's like just by that time, somebody can have an have an issue and then trying to scrape the cars and all that. So we we called it, which you know, a lot of people still working, but it's, it's one of those things that if we're taking safety serious, you have to make those considerations of hey. Like today is not a day that we should be outside or doing any of that. And then sometimes it's, you don't want to do it. You lose production, you lose money that day, you lose that, but you, you don't want to have anybody get seriously hurt. So, yeah, because we're all responsible for our safety, right? So, if you feel as a person, right, as a personal responsibility, right, uh, if you don't feel it's safe, don't do it. You know, uh, have that communication. Yeah, it, it it's unfortunate that, you know, we don't want a culture and a workforce that says, oh, I'm scared to do my job. You know what I mean? Or go to work, right? We don't want that. But at the same time, us as per people, we have to say, hey, am I putting myself at risk by doing this? You know, what are what are some of the things that, like I said, we that, that something that certainly could be inflated, right? Because it's making a personal decision. Um, but we all should, you know, consider those things when, whenever we've got a place to go or that, like I said, that weather or the situation is just questionable, right? So very good. That's a good point. Uh, and, and at what point when it's that cold outside, just to get to the job site, are they productive? You, you know, I mean, at what point, you know, uh, are you getting what you need out of that group when they're freezing? So yeah, things to pay attention to. Uh, good point, Joe. Thank you. Anybody else? Welcome, Warren. Andy, anything to point out? Anything we should be aware of? Don, John. Uh, no, this is Andy. Um, the only thing I uh, would like to point out, uh, slightly off topic from the weather, uh, is. Um, so recently we had an incident where OSHA was called on the job. It was by a disgruntled ex-employee, not our employee. It was a uh, different employee from another company. And um, <clears throat> what occurred uh, was OSHA actually came to the job site. And then we called our, we partner with ADP. We're on total source. So they have a safety program and a, a part of our, they help them administer our HR Anyhow, um, the safety uh, representative came out and interviewed and everything and was telling us that there is, because of the OSHA being shut down for several years, they are out in force right now and they're investigating all kinds of, of incidents that they probably wouldn't have in the past. Um, plus, they've got some additional funding and they're trying to spend it so um well, we'll it's anecdotal but that. that's we have meredith with osha here today to give us a presentation so uh oh okay great yeah so it's a good possibility when 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 she gets into her discussion as far as what was noticed in 2022 as far as the heavy hitters when it comes to occupational safety hazard but also probably you know what what's in their forecast what's in their crystal ball as far as like what they're going to be focusing in on and and uh and to what right uh frequency of inspections right and things like that so uh once we're done with these discussions i'd love to introduce her if you guys are ready uh, is there anything else we want to uh talk about when it comes to near misses or are we ready to move forward all right moving forward uh meredith good morning and thank you so much for joining the group good morning how's everyone doing today good yeah, thank you. thank you. So I have a presentation that I can share my screen with you guys. <clears throat> awesome. So for doing our um, OSHA update with you guys, I, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a compliance assistance specialist within the Denver area office. 
I've worked with OSHA since 2007 and have been a compliance officer since 2010. Um, I'm an industrial hygienist, so I try to focus more on the health side. However, in our office, we're so busy that we do it all. So um, we are not safe from doing safety inspections as industrial hygienists in our office. Um, here's my contact information. I can also have um, Paul send it out to you later if you guys still need it. Um, we also have, um, I know that you guys worked with John Oliachea in the past. He has moved on to the OSHA Training Institute. Real so quick, when, Meredith, we yeah. don't see your screen. You don't see my screen? Right. Hmm. How's that? We can see it now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, John has moved on within OSHA. He is at the OSHA Training Institute. And my understanding is he's helping develop training for um, OSHA in general, but um, focusing mainly on compliance officers. We've got a lot of new, um, we've got a lot of national emphasis programs. We're getting some more regional emphasis programs and local emphasis programs. So I'm assuming that he's going to try and help mainstream all of that. So in his position, um, we now have four compliance assistance specialists. One is in Billings, then covers Montana. One is in Sioux Falls and covers North Dakota and South Dakota. And then I'm in the Denver area office um, and Hector is in the Inglewood area office. And the way Colorado is broken down is what is shown on the map. So Denver tends to cover Northern Colorado, if you want to call it that, and Inglewood will be in um, Southern Colorado. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about our emphasis programs. Um, our region has a new powered industrial vehicle emphasis program. Uh, so I'll go over that with you, do a little bit over the inspection process, go over standards and common hazards, do a little bit, touch a little bit on record keeping because the deadline for electronic reporting is coming up, and then give you a brief synopsis of what OSHA has in the hopper. So what does OSHA do? We develop safety and health standards, conduct inspections and enforcement, and produce compliance assistance products. So what we're, what my job now is to do is to put out compliance assistance for everybody. Um, we want to concentrate on possibly creating more alliances and more partnerships, um, getting you guys in contact with state consultation out of CSU consultation, um, if you guys are interested in doing something like that. We also have SHARPS programs for small employers who want to go above and beyond and join the SHARPS program. And then we also have BPP, which is a, about the same thing, except it, it's a larger for larger companies. So our national emphasis programs, these are in every state, um, whether it's a federal, federal state or a state plan state. Um, we do focus, my I know from my office, we go out on amputations a lot. Um, trenching a lot, uh, respirable silica. Um, we do end up in foundries uh, for metal, uh, metal exposure and um, any lots of manufacturing places for hexavalent chromium. So these are all nationwide. So any state you operate in will have these emphasis programs. So in our region, which consists of um, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana, we have these emphasis programs. Again, any fall, anybody that we drive by that we see doesn't have fall protection on, we have the ability to stop and do an inspection. That's how we end up at trenches too. We have, if we see a trench, good or bad, we can stop and do an inspection. Um, just because we stop doesn't mean that you have a bad trench, but that's what we're on the look for. We might wanna make as much contact with trenching due to the, um, rise in trenching fatalities that the nation has seen in the last couple of years. Um, we end up at oil and gas a lot. Uh, the beverage manufacturing, we end up in breweries a lot now. People are becoming more aware of our emphasis program, so are giving us calls if there's expo CO exposure there. Um, automotive services due to um, injuries and fatalities with automotive lifts, we've been getting more calls on that. Um, silica, we brought back when um, the silica standard was instituted, we had to rewrite our directive. So we finally got that written in. We're back in um, silica shops, uh, concrete manufacturing, concrete cutting, noise-induced hearing loss. We're just starting that as well. And then, like I said, our powered industrial vehicles were um, that just 
we started doing enforcement on that um, in the last couple months. And then some offices have um, emphasis programs specific to their jurisdiction. Inglewood has asbestos recycling and aircraft maintenance. And then Billings has a program for wood manufacturing. As I said, we just um, started our emphasis program for PIVs and it'll cover any mobile power propelled truck used to carry push pull lift stack or tier materials, whether ridden by an operator or controlled by a walking operator. So the, it covers everything, anything that can be used to move material, we will be looking at it. And it's, we wanna note that golf carts or electric trucks used to transport personnel or ATV are also covered. So these are the primary NAICS that are gonna be covered. If your NAICS starts with any of these three, we will be, um, you will end up on our list. So how this works out is when you guys register your businesses, you register a NAICS, that NAICS is sent to BLS. We, we give um, BLS the list of NAICS where we found common injuries regarding um, powered industrial vehicles. And they pull a list of companies that are, fall under these NAICS. Those NAICS are then sent to the national office. The national office reviews the list and then the list is sent to us. Then within our regional office, they divide companies that fall into our jurisdiction. Those lists are sent to the area offices. And then somewhere in the area, someone in the area office pulls those lists, goes through them and starts generating random lists of locations. So if you, your NAICS code starts with any of these, you're, there's a great good possibility you will end up on our list. That's one way that we would get into your facility. The other way is if we have a complaint filed regarding any of the powered industrial vehicles in, at your location, or if there is a reportable injury or fatality within your facility, then we would end up coming to your facility to do an inspection. And this doesn't apply to general industry only. It, we will look at um, all these vehicles on a construction site as well. So examples of trucks that we're gonna be looking at, um, the cantilever lift truck is one people wouldn't think that we would be looking at. Um, the high lift truck, the reach truck, motorized hand trucks, a lot of people don't think that those would be covered by us, but we will be looking at those as well. And then for construction sites, rough terrain, aerial lifts, skid steers, pallet jacks. So 29 CFR 191078 is consistently in the top 10 for federal citations and federal, in federal inspections. The number of fatalities um, involving these vehicles is it has increased from 60 to 95 in the between the years 20, 2017 and 2019. And again, it takes us a long time to get the directives and emphasis programs in place. So that's why the data is a little uh, dated. We had to pull, went from the time that we start writing a directive, we start pulling data and that's the data that we have to use in our report. So it's outdated um, as to this is how we got to this point. And according to BLS, 614 forklift related fatalities happened between 2011 and 2017. 7,000 non-fatal injuries with days away from work occur each year. And in 2017, there was 9,050 workplace injuries with days away. Between 2017 and 2021, there was 16, over, over almost 17,000 citations issued nationally. And a little over 11,000 of those were serious citations. Regionally, we had 341 citations and 14 fatalities. This is, a, sorry, my dog's barking. Let me mute myself for a second. Sorry about that. So on OSHA's website, we have a powered industrial trucks forklift e-tool. Here you will find everything that OSHA has collected or has training material on for powered industrial forklifts. This is a good source for you guys to look at and see what it is that we could possibly be looking at when we are entering your facilities. And I kind of touched on this, um, how we get in your facilities is national and regional emphasis programs, complaints, referrals, reports of fatalities. So referrals we can get from other sources. Um, one source, one of the sources that we get is uh, 
sheriff's departments. Sheriff's departments call us a lot. Um, we get news referrals from the media. Um, we get people watching TV on a news story that's being filmed in front of a construction site and they'll notice someone on a roof without a without a without um, any fall protection and they'll give us a call. So we can take referrals um, from outside sources. It doesn't necessarily have to be an employee. So the inspection process, we do not give notice for inspections. Um, we will come to the site, make contact with whoever. If it's a fixed facility, obviously it's gonna be the person at the front desk. If it's a construction site, if we know the GC, we'll go to the GC's trailer. Um, if we don't know the GC, we'll grab whoever we have on, we find on site first and have them, you know, find the people that we need. Um, we'll present our credentials. We'll let you know why we're there. We'll let you know what your rights as an employer is during an ocean inspection. During the inspection, we request documentation. What we request a lot is based, well, what I will, why I used to request when I was a compliance officer is I would request the, um, the title page and the co table of contents for your safety program. And then from, the, from that, I would determine what programs I want or what chapters I want from you guys. What is really is requested a lot is um, emergency action plans, fall protection plans. If you guys are trenching, trenching, um, what you guys, the trenching plans and data for that. Um, hazard communication, it doesn't matter what kind of site you have, there's gonna be chemicals of some sort on there. So it, we, we always request hazard communication. The one thing that we also request is training records for any and all um, chapters that we may be requesting. So we do issue a lot of training citations. So you wanna make sure that you have your training documents squared away. Um, if there's a union rep on site, we'll ask if they wanna take part in the walk around. And then we answer any questions that um, the employer may have at that time. During this time, um, I meant the gentleman mentioned that they wanted their safety rep on site. So OSHA's um, policy with that is yes, we will wait what the compliance officer feels is a sufficient amount of time for that safety rep to show up. And if it's going to say we arrive at the site and he's we're up in Sterling and he's in not going to wait for him to get there. So what we'll do is we'll allow them to join either with new technology. They can FaceTime with us, be on the phone, but we aren't necessarily going to wait for them to arrive. Um, when they are within, you know, 20 minutes drive, it's up to the compliance officer whether they want to wait or not. Usually what we'll do, what I used to do is give them a courtesy of about 15 to 20 minutes. And then if the person couldn't arrive, then we would start the walk around and the represent the safety representative could catch up with us when they arrive. So we do a walkthrough during our inspection. We um, visually inspect the facility or the job site. Anything in plain view is fair game for a compliance officer if they choose to do that. Um, there's some compliance officers that, especially if it's a complaint and there's focused items, we'll just look at those items only and not expand. Um, what I've noticed recently, we um, have, well, not it's not new management. We've got a new area director and some new AAB starting in 2020. And I've noticed that they've been wanting um, co-shows to expand to plain view more often than we used to. Um, so it's kind of up to the compliance officer what they choose to do. We do audio and visual recordings. If there's um, health exposure, noise, or air contaminants, we may we can't, if it's a construction site, we may do um, sampling then. If it's a fixed facility, we may come back and arrange a date and time for the sampling to occur. If any measurements need to be made, um, height, of a, height of a roof, depth, depth of a trench, width of a trench, they'll go ahead and take those measurements. And then we try to do employee interviews that day, um, if possibly can. If it's just not possible, um, then we will we schedule employee interviews and the employee interviews are private and confidential. When the walk around um, is over, we'll do a first closing conference. We'll let you know what um, violations we may have seen. Um, we'll discuss employer rights and responsibilities with you and then we'll discuss citation categories. So repeat citations are if you've been cited for say fall protection before within the last five years, then you'll get a repeat. Um, if there's, if we feel that you are will, 
willfully disregarding employee safety, um, then we will go after a willful citation. And I can tell you um, in the past year or so, this has applied to almost any trench inspection we do. Um, and then there's serious citations, which have a, I'll repeat willful and serious all will always have a monetary penalty. Other than serious citations are more of a paperwork citation, like you don't have um, your SDSs, you don't have your training documents. It's honestly up to my area director whether she wants to assess a penalty against those citations or not. If citations are issued, you have three options. You can accept the citation and any all penalties and provide us with uh, the payment and your abatement as soon as possible. Um, I would say 95% of the time people do informal conferences. So the day that you receive your citations in the mail, it'll have a green card on it. When you um, sign that green card, that's when your 15 business days starts. If you are cited, I usually recommend that the employer call the OSHA office that day and schedule your informal conference. That way we make sure that you guys get in within your 15 business days. Um, due to COVID, most of these have been over the phone still. Um, we are starting to have, my area director is starting to have some people come into the office. I don't know how um, she decides who she wants to see in person or not, but just call and um, leave a message if no one answers the phone and someone will get back to you. And then if you don't, are not happy with the outcome of your informal conference, then you can choose to contest any and all citations and penalties. And then after that, that is business between um, what my area office will try to do is my area, area director will try to work with you um, before the final contest is actually filed. If you and my area director cannot come to a, um, to a conclusion, then the information is passed on to our regional office and then it is given to our solicitor's office. And then our, our lawyers will start dealing with your lawyers. So as of the first of the year, OSHA increased their penalties about $600. So serious other than serious and failure to have your OSHA um, poster posted is a $15,625 fine. Um, failure to obey is also the same amount. Now, when, with willfuls or repeats, they can start at 156625 per violation. So obviously you really wanna avoid any citations in general. So this is the COSHOs have to follow our field operations manual. This shows us how we're, our, this teaches us how to do our inspections. Um, it explains how we are going to be instituting emphasis programs, how we need to determine our sampling criteria, how we issue citations and um, what happens after post citations. So the thing that goes along with this as well as other directives, um, this is what we fall back on for issuing citations. However, we do have specific directions on um, like hazard communication. How we cite hazard communication is all dependent on how you guys are running your hazard comm program. If you have bits and pieces, then it's cited differently than if you have nothing at all. But that's a whole nother presentation. So the top 10 violations for FY 2022, um, fall protection, has comm, respiratory protection, ladders, scaffolding, lockout, tag out, training requirements for fall protection, eye and face protection, powered industrial trucks, and machine guarding. I would say that these are always the top 10. They just move to different places. Um, fall protection usually is number one. To be honest, I'm surprised that trenching is not on here. This is what we have saw in FY 2021 for the construction industry, fall protection, ladder, scaffolding, training, about Everything's almost exactly the same. This one actually has excavation on it. In general industry, uh, respiratory protection, I would say respiratory protection was probably due to COVID. A lot of people did not understand that if you're putting an employee in an N95, you have to have a fit test and a medical evaluation for that employee. Um, and then HASCOM, PIVs, lockout, tag out. Um, Reporting fatalities is actually pretty high nationwide. A lot of people don't understand the a fatality reported within eight hours, a hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye within 24 hours. They think that they have wiggle room in there and they don't. Um, I know that my area director is very strict on that. 
And then um, oil and gas has come, respiratory protection, um, general duty clause ends up in oil and gas a lot because OSHA does not necessarily have oil and gas standards. When they're um, rigging up or rigging down, they fall under our construction standard. When they're in their general daily operations, they fall under our general industry standard. So we there's a lot of gray area for oil and gas. If you wanna get online and see what your high, highest cited citations are within your NAICS code, this is how you do it. You can select number employees or just do all, and then you enter your NAICS code and enter submit, and it'll give you statistics for the last FY. So this year for electrical contractors from October, 2021 to September, 2022, there was 335 citations issued nationwide. Um, the highest one was lack of fall protection, then ladders, and then aerial lifts. And then that 1904-39 is failure to report hospitalizations, fatalities, injuries. So they are issuing those citations nationwide. So record keeping, who needs to report their injuries and illnesses. There is the small employer exemption of 10 or fewer employees at all times during the year. If at any time you had 10 employees, you even if it was for a day, you have to file or you have to report on OSHA 300 logs. Um, there's a low hazard industry exemption list that you can find on, on our website that gets updated every year, so that changes. Um, fatalities and other serious event reporting as well as injury and illness surveys involve other considerations. Um, you just have to do your due diligence to make sure that um, you guys are reporting what you need to report. We have the OSHA 300 log, the 301 and the 301 or 300As. Um, making, we do look at this when we go to sites. Um, obviously, if you're moving around um, doing on construction sites and aren't more there for more than a year, then you don't have to keep your logs. But when we go to um, like long-term sites, like say the Amazon building that they're building up in Loveland, we'll be asking them for their records because they've been there for over a year now. Um, we look at their 300 logs. If anything stands out to us, we'll ask for the 301s. And then if it has been time for you guys to post your 300 A's, we will, um, we will ask for those. A lot of citations that I have written regarding the summary form, is something as simple as not signing and dating those forms or just not having them ready in general. So you need to make sure that you're keeping those and posting them when they're supposed to be posted. So for it to be recordable, that has the has to have an injury and illness, be work related, and have um, meet the certain criteria. And the severity criteria is death, loss of consciousness days away from work, restricted work activity or job transfer, and medical treatment beyond first aid. So this is a little de decision tree that we have. Um, I don't know if it's on the OSHA website or if this is something that was just put out within OSHA. Um, just helps you walk yourself through your decision making um, and letting you know if you guys need to record it or not. Again, I already went over this. You guys have eight hours to report a fatality and 24 hours to report a hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye. Now there's some caveats to that. Um, if an employee is injured, sent to the hospital, or doesn't go to the hospital, but late within that 24 hours, then decides they need to go to the hospital, then that counts as a hospitalization. If the hospitalization occurs outside of the 24 hours, then that isn't, isn't reportable, but it's still recordable. So you still have to have that on your OSHA 300 logs, but you don't necessarily need to report it to us. And um, in the cases of uh, COVID, because they uh, an employee could be hospitalized, say for up to a month. So you need to notify us of that. And then if the employee ends up passing away, you need to notify us within eight hours of their passing. Electronic submitting. So the injury tracking application is open. You can enter your information and you need to do that by March 2nd of every year. 
Um, 250 or more employees are currently required to keep their injury and illness records in establishments with 20 to 249 that are classified in certain industries or historically high rates of occupational injuries and illnesses need to be reporting on this. They, we have a um, standard in the line, which I'll briefly touch on where they're trying to update this to make it a little more mainstream. There was discussion of changing it to 100 or more employees, and they're also just trying to make the tracking easier for you guys. They've also are revisiting possibly making certain companies and industries um, submit their 301 forms. But again, that's it isn't a standard yet. They're just working on it. So our regulatory agenda, we have pre-rule actions where OSHA has shown high injury and illness rates or the need to create a new standard and they put out feelers. They ask for um, what how people feel about it, what they're seeing, if it's something that they think would be a good rule. The proposed rules are the ones that have made it through pre-rule and we are currently writing a standard on. And then final rules are ones that we're just waiting to have them released. Long-term actions are things that OSHA has in line, but they don't see anything happening with them in the next year. And if you go to reginfo.gov, you will see every federal agency that has a new regulation in, um, in any stage will be available to you, for you to review what's going on with that on that website. So proposed rules, the biggest one, obviously, that people are concerned about is infectious disease. Um, and that isn't just COVID specific, it's to any infectious disease. Um, communication powers is a big one. We've seen a lot of injuries and fatalities in, in the communication industry. Lockout, tag out, they're trying to update that. Update welding and construction, PPE and construction. They're trying because most regions have a powered industrial truck um, emphasis program. They're trying to come up with a more specific standard. Our powered industrial truck design standard is very murky. It's not very plain language for everybody. And then um, having a worker walk around um, on OSHA inspections is another one that they're working on. And it doesn't have to just be a union representative. It can just be any employee that is interested in participating in the OSHA inspection. Pre-rule stage, things that we are getting um, information and feedback on. Improving our PSM standard mechanical power presses, uh, workplace violence and healthcare, blood lead levels for medical removal, meaning if you exceed a certain blood lead level, then you can no longer do that job, and heat illness. And as you know, our region has a emphasis program on heat on indoor and outdoor settings. Final rule stage is um, update to the hazard communication standard. We are only in line, so we wanna line up with the UN's version of HASCOM. When we in instituted our GHS in 2012, the UN was on their third version of their GHS standards. We are gonna update to the seventh version of the UN standards, but the UN is already on their ninth version. So we're still falling behind with getting everything uh, lined up across the board. They wanna revisit um, retaliation for the Taxpayer Act, whistleblower protection, anti-money laundering and criminal antitrust. Um, they're still working on finalizing the COVID-19 standard. They wanted to release it at the end of December and did not get that done. Um, they're also attempting to, like I said, improve the tracking of workplace injuries and illnesses. That is expected to come out, I believe, in March of this year. And then um, procedures for the use of administrative sub subpoenas. This is just to streamline how OSHA is subpoenaing documents and or employees to interview. Um, it's kind of, in our region, we have uh, form letters that we we um, are using. There's people in the private sector that believe OSHA is out overreaching. And so OSHA is just trying to get a streamlined process. Things that we have coming long-term, um, restoring MSDs to the OSHA 300 log. Like I said, powered industrial trucks, um, restructuring the silica table and construction. And then um, COVID-19 vaccination, the, the temporary standard. I don't think that that is gonna um, 
the vaccination. I don't think that's going to be revisited, but that's just my personal opinion. So contacting your local um, compliance assistance officer, as I explained before, I'm in the Denver office. Hector is in the Inglewood office. If you're working in any other states, you can go to our website and find out who the compliance assistance specialist is in the state, the other states you're working with. And on our website, we have help for employers. Um, this is our FAQ. If you have any questions, um, whether or not you fall under OSHA, whether or not certain work sites fall under OSHA. Um, if at any time you can't, like I said, if you can't find what you're looking for, you can always call me. Um, I can't say I'm always available, but I will get back to you or email. I'll email you as soon as I can. And this is just a national disclaimer saying that I created this presentation and it's not direction from the national office and it's not set in stone that everything that I say can be taken for, for what it is. And that's the end of my presentation. Wow, that was a lot of information. Thank you so much uh, for breaking that down for us. Uh, definitely some things to focus in on. Did anybody have any questions for Meredith? Full of information. Yeah, we have a OSHA has a lot going on in the last couple of years. And um, to speak on what the gentleman was saying about increased OSHA inspections. So just in general, OSHA has had a lot of turnover in compliance officers and then getting people onboarded. So that's kind of why there was the perceived lull in, its, in inspections. Now that we're starting to get fully staffed up and get our compliance officers trained, there's more just there's just more boots on the ground right now. And a big emphasis, a big push. We, at least for our region, we have a new, well, we got a new RA, a regional administrator in January of 2021. Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Rouse. She came from the Navy. She has a master or a doctorate in health and safety. She is passionate about health and safety and is pushing us out the door as fast as we can go. We also have a new um, deputy regional administrator, Steve Biasi. He is from, comes from region one and region three. He has worked for OSHA for 28 years. He was a um, compliance officer for most of that time. He was an assistant area director for five years, I believe, and an area director for two years. And he is also a volunteer firefighter. So he is very passionate about trenching. Um, we are working with authorities in Weld County to get a handle on trenching. Um, so we're those are the two falls and trenching are the two main things that at least people in my office go out on um, a lot. We are seeing um, an uptick in for whatever reason, just injuries in all industries. Amputations are up. Um, I'm trying to think what else we've been getting a lot of. I think, yeah, amputations. Um, and as I said before, anybody can file a complaint with us regarding our emphasis programs. We do usually ask that they provide us with some sort of documentation. We try not to just take people's words for it. Like if, um, we had a complainant that would had a long-term construction site across from her house for about a year or two. And we would get a call from her like at least once a month. So that's kind of when our office started requiring docu some documentation from repeat customers. Um, if we can, we like them to email us pictures so that our main thing is, it's not that we don't want to go out there. It's just that we don't want to waste our time when our time can be spent somewhere else. Sure. So we don't, we don't always take everybody's word for it. Um, we do try to vet some of the complaints, but yeah, if we get a fall or a trench call, regardless of whether it's valid or not, we're going to go. So that's just one thing you guys need to know. Um, fall from height is huge in our region, as well as, as you know, trenching. We've had a lot of trenching fatalities. Actually, um, in a couple weeks, we're present. I'm, I'm going to be presenting on the trench fatality um, up in Granby. We had a, a, a cave in. Um, it actually ended up going to criminal court, and the owner was sentenced to 18 months in prison. Wow. So um, that was one of our willful 
our willful inspections that we had um, that we've come across, and that's why our our office has such an emphasis on trenching. So, um, and so actually, that was, like a, that was just an observation, like a drive-by, right? That one of your your people have had. And yeah, and it was actually the initial complaint came from the city inspector up there. Oh, um, so there was a formal complaint. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, the city inspector, we actually ended up getting a call from the Granby Sheriff after the fact, but the city inspector had been there before and had voiced his um, concerns with the trench. And that just the chain of events leading up to the actual cave-in is what allowed us to um, file a willful. And then the county DA was following the case very closely. And once OSHA closed their case, they opened theirs. So, so that's a that's a good point. And so for for the group, you know, we do have we posted on our on the chat there our schedule for 2023. And what's not on there, I don't think, is it? Oh uh, no, we have in April. So we've got trench and land movement safety. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's be sure, right? Because we know. Uh, it's a huge emphasis right now. I don't know how much, you know, uh, depending on the scale of y'all's projects, how much land movement you're doing right. Uh, uh, but that'll be a good session uh, for us to join in on. OK, uh, we'll probably be bringing in uh, Fiore for that um, to, to talk about land movement and trenching safety. Is that cool? Uh, that's a good point. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, well, we and have to answer deck, Jack's so, question right. about if there's any more pending, I don't know that, right? Um, the solicitor, if there is, our solicitor's office keeps that pretty close to their chest because the, the announcement has to come from our national office. But to my knowledge, no, there's nothing else. Very awesome. Well, taking a look at the information, it looks like the number one hitter in our industry, once again, is fall protection. Okay, so... Something just, uh, you know, as we move forward, uh, let's be sure that our gear, our harnesses, right, our, our fall arrest systems, and we've got some good anchorage going on, right? We've got some barriers put up and labels and signage, um, whatever it is your fall protection program entails, you know, uh, it's, a, it's one of the biggest hitters every year is falls. Um, and so... Uh, always make sure that we're we're take, we're paying attention to that right i believe the standards is anything over six feet in height right you have to have some type of fall arrest system and lanyard is it six feet i believe um so. yeah it's six feet and you also want to um look at your articulating boom lifts too um that's where we see people getting flown out of flung out of baskets as well yeah, drive especially if you're driving them with uh with the necks out, they become really bouncy. You know, uh, anybody ever have a, a genie lift or something like that bounce on you? Uh, it, it it'll it'll wake you up. Um, so yeah, just be extra careful. Make sure your and and your lanyards right and everything like that are in good repair. And that uh, uh, there certainly needs to be a JSA right uh put together whenever you're working at heights, whether you're off a ladder, scaffold, lift right those types of things you know it's important that uh we have the measures to, to to put into place right any other questions maybe the group had uh for meredith or anything we wanted to point out that we noticed on the uh presentation that uh uh was surprising to you you're all making it really easy hey, meredith this is Jack. Hey, I got a quick question for you or uh, Paul. Will this be available? This yeah, I'm information? Gonna, yeah, I'm going to send the notes um, to Paul and have him dis or distribute it to you guys as needed. Yeah, so awesome. uh, this, this video is recorded. We'll be sending the video out. No, that's cool. Good stuff. Uh, that's really, really good stuff. Thank you so much, Meredith, for your time this morning. There's a lot of information, a lot, a lot of stuff that, uh, that both myself and our team here can bring back to our organizations and, and say, here is, 
you know, here's what uh, happened last year. Here's what we need to focus in on, right? Because our industry, because uh, 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 I, I appreciate you doing the stats on our industry. I appreciate that. Uh, that's awesome and good information for all of our safety programs right there, right? As far as uh, what we need to put in place. Uh, uh, so great information. I think it's great information for your leadership in the company too. Absolutely. And we got to share this Um you know, the trenching thing is just crazy. I don't get that at all. Yeah, and if you guys are interested more in trenching or getting more training in trenching, uh, we do have an annual trench summit. We pair with NUCA and we go out to Adams County Fairgrounds and they dig trenches. They usually have about four trenches that they dig and we have stations where people discuss um, sloping, um, shoring, the trench boxes you're using, hydraulic trench boxes, um, and work uh, work zone safety. And then there's another um, section or another station that um, goes over chains and slings and things such as that. Yeah, and that usually cool. takes place in October, early October. Yeah, but we can't wait, Meredith. We got to make sure <laughs> everybody understands. I mean, I'm a certified safety professional myself and you know i have that obligation to make sure my leadership understands what you guys are doing and you know the ramifications yeah and we understand that it's just a we just have a, that standing summit every october that's cool <clears throat> Very awesome. Very awesome. Well, group, um, we're going to go ahead and if there's no other questions, we'll get this wrapped up. Our next meeting is on the 22nd of February and we'll be covering lockout tagout practices. Um, I probably might be reaching out to somebody like you, Jack, because uh, 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 I know that you've got an awesome program as far as how you do it and your logging and uh, of your lockout tagout and the scope of work. Um, or maybe just somebody, you know, that's interested to talking about lockout tag out. Um, so that's happened on the 22nd. Uh, after that, we've got ladder ergonomics on, on March 29th. And then in April is when we've got that trench and land management safety. So uh, if we need or need or want to, um, uh, we're open to new topics or to shuffling a few things around if we need to, to, to put a more you know, direct focus on that emphasis. So all you have to do is just let us know. We can talk about it. I usually pull together a handful of people to discuss that, like Joe and maybe Kurt and Jack that that sees what that importance is, you know, but uh, uh, if there's anything that we're missing as far as a focus and looking at uh, uh, the stats for our industry, uh, those will be things that I'll be uh, taking a look at and doing some crosswalk with what we have on schedule. So uh, all really good stuff. Uh, any last questions or uh, items to discuss? I hope everybody has an awesome, safe Wednesday, and uh, we will see you soon, okay? Thank you so much, Meredith. Thank you so much. Holly, thanks for being on the backdrop, taking care of all of the documentation. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah. Thank you, everybody. You thanks, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good presentation. Thanks, Jack. Kurt, y'all good, my friend? Mr. Hiltz, y'all good? <laughs>